So, I was thinking maybe I should give my thoughts on transhumanism. Transhumanism. What are your general thoughts of transhumanism? What do you know about it? And, uh, well, my understanding of transhumanism is that basically it involves using technology to transcend our limitations as human beings. And most of the time when I've heard people discuss transhumanism, they were talking about life extension, even to the point of living forever physically on this earth because obviously we as human beings don't have that physical capability, but there are people who think that technology could be used to achieve that. Now the first time that I ever heard about transhumanism, I was actually sitting on an airplane with a guy who was really into it. He had magazines and things that, that had to do with it, and this is about three or four years ago. And the thing that we were discussing was the idea of basically scanning someone's brain and taking all the data from their brain because obviously our brain works on electric impulses and if there would be a way to basically you know read someone's mind scan their brain electronically and then put that data into like some kind of a hard drive some kind of a storage device and obviously it's it sounds crazy and far-fetched but you know obviously that's where the technology is going in a sense because um, even in our film uh, after the tribulation we briefly touch on the fact that the brain scan technology is, is rapidly advancing where people can think about things and then it could you know literally write words on a computer screen or, or make an image come on a computer screen just based on their thoughts so the theory was that if this were to keep progressing you could just basically take the entire contents of someone's brain all their memories everything about the way they think and then transfer that to a hard drive and store that <laughs> and then you know to take it even further would be to like take that information and then like upload it into like an Android or something you know this is mm -hmm. what this guy was talking about as a way to achieve immortality because we've taken everything out of you and then put it into another <laughs> vessel as yeah. it were okay now I don't believe we're ever gonna achieve that but I'm just telling you this is what the guy explained to me on the airplane mm -hmm. okay and the thing that I thought about with that is that, you know, let's say you really could do that just theoretically. If you took all the information from someone's brain and put it into a machine like a robot or an android, you know, would that be you? Because they're saying this is immortality. But I don't, obviously, I don't believe that it would be because what you could create at best would be, you know, a machine that thinks it's you because it has all the memories that you have and it has your proclivities and it, and, it, and it acts like you and maybe even someone else could think it's you but would it be you but then there's another question that goes even deeper than that is that you know this thing this machine would not be conscious so could it would it even really think it's you does it even have any consciousness to think anything at all or is it just going through the motions of acting how you would act and doing what you would do you kind of see what oh, i'm saying yes completely, yeah. yeah okay but then there's another question beyond that of, okay, let's say that you could, you know, take all the contents of someone's brain and then put it into a machine. And then that machine even were to have a consciousness where it thinks it's you, okay. Then the question is, you know, would that have any free will? Because of the fact that, you know, I believe that we as human beings have free will, but that that would come from the soul. Whereas could a machine actually have free will you know I don't think so so I don't think a machine could have consciousness number one and I don't think that a machine could have free will either because that's two different issues uh -huh. right there okay because let's say you program this thing to be like you then it would just let's say continue in the patterns that you've lived up until that point but could it make new decisions and, and take new pathways and routes you know is that would be a different issue so Absolutely. yeah so my my take on it is this though you know I know that right now there's not a computer that's as powerful as the human mind I mean the human mind is the most powerful processor on this planet but the scientists and people are predicting that eventually they could develop a computer as powerful as the human mind and then more powerful than the human mind 
But where I would approach this from a biblical perspective, you know, I would point to a few scriptures in Genesis, okay? okay. First of all, in, in Genesis chapter 3, it's right at the very beginning of the Bible, after Adam and Eve have, have eaten the forbidden fruit. This is what God says in verse 22 of chapter 3. The Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So in the story basically, you know, when mankind is to a point where he's achieving a, you know, godlike status, God puts a stop to it and says, he's not going to allow God, he's not going to allow man to understand good and evil in the way that he does and live forever. So he basically kicks him out of the garden of Eden just to withhold him from having eternal life, uh -huh. okay? Then, just a few chapters later, there's the story of the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11, okay? And this is after Noah, after the flood and everything, and mankind is united, and they have built a city, and they're building this tower to reach unto heaven and so forth. And here's what God says in Genesis chapter 11, verse 5, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do. And then listen to this next phrase. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. So here again, man is achieving something that God doesn't want him to achieve, going beyond mm -hmm. a certain boundary that God has put on man, and God puts a stop to it. So my perspective on this is that before mankind could ever get to these levels of technology where he's achieving a godlike status, okay, of being able to live forever mm -hmm. in any capacity, or even to be able to create you know, artificial intelligence in, in the sense of, you know, conscious, sentient, you know, uh, beings in the form of, you know, computers. Mm -hmm. I believe that before that, God will put a stop to it. And, and the way I think that's going to happen is just that, you know, we know from the Bible that there's going to be the, the events of the end times, the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus Christ. So my perspective on this as a Bible-believing Christian is that, the end of the world, as the Bible calls it, will just take place before man reaches these levels of technology. Okay. I see. Now, aside from the, the style of transhumanism that that guy on the airplane talked to me about, as far as, you know, taking the contents of your brain and, and moving it to another vessel, and, and as I said before, I don't believe that the, the soul would go with it, you know. Mm -hmm. it, at best, it would be a machine that thought it was you, but it wouldn't really be you. That's my opinion mm -hmm. on that. But actually, I actually agree with you. Oh, okay. I think in the future, there'll probably be a bunch of machines pretending to be like their original person mm -hmm. that was mind uploaded in the machine, but they'll just be... But it's not really them. Yeah, it's not really yeah. them. Well, and see, we I believe in the soul, the spirit you know, which is beyond just the flesh here, okay. But then another style of transhumanism would be to, you know, leave your existing brain in place because obviously that's the seat of our thought and consciousness and basically to replace other body parts with a body part that would not wax old, you know, for yeah. example, obviously, you know, a, a, an artificial heart yeah. or just other artificial but components keep and keep the brain that's but, my personal strategy I but then again the with the brain is the, isn't the brain gonna wear out though I don't know I mean what you know let's say you make everything else durable mm -hmm. and 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 permanent will the brain ever just eventually run out you know obviously the way it plays out now is that somebody's heart gives out or other processes in the body fail but if those other processes were extended, how long does a brain last? That's a very you know, good it's, question. It's a valid question. Yeah. And I'd be willing to bet it's probably not forever. Yeah, we probably last. need some kind of other intervention to keep the brain healthy. 
maybe right. going there with nanobots and clean up the damage or just some way to keep it alive. Some way to uh, restore it. Yeah. And then um, basically, you know, if, if basically these type of things were to, to be implemented, the, you know, just theoretically, hypothetically, this happened and, the, you know, the second coming of Christ has not yet taken place, then that would just show that I was wrong when I said that God would put a stop to things before that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. I mean, it wouldn't make me lose faith in the Bible or, right. or lose faith in the eventual second coming of Jesus Christ. It would yeah. just mean that I was wrong on that particular theory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, what if, uh, do you think that it's your duty to, like, stop any of these technologies or do you want them, would you want to just let them go? Well, I don't really think it's any of my business, mm -hmm. you know, to try to stop these type of technologies. Now, when it comes to the um, the genetic modification, though, that is something that I would have concerns about and fears about and, and want to put a stop to, yeah. okay? That's the train of thought that I lost a little bit earlier. That's okay, what I was thinking okay. of, actually, it would be a third pathway besides the, you know, the downloading, as it were, besides the replacing of body parts that would wax old with permanent body parts but but the third pathway would be a a tampering with the dna you know a turning off mm -hmm. of this gene or that gene or a splicing of of sorts you know that's the one that would be scary because there's already genetic modification going on in the realm of plants and animals right we have the gmo mm -hmm. plants and and G, even gmo insects and a lot of these things have had unintended consequences because once you release these organisms into the environment, you know, you can't put the cat back into the bag in a sense because, you know, once the genie's out of the bottle, now you've got all these insects and plants and they get out there in the wild and they take over. And whenever man tries to mess with God's order, there can be a lot of unintended consequences. Like it reminded me of one time I was working in this water filtration plant and there were just ladybugs everywhere. Just late, you couldn't even hardly walk without stepping on ladybugs and there's just ladybugs. And I asked this guy, you know, what is the deal? What's going on? And he said, well, you know, they brought these ladybugs in to deal with some other small problem that they had. Like, oh, these ladybugs are gonna fix it. But because they were not indigenous to that area, they had no natural predators. So now they're just reproducing unchecked and there's just ladybugs everywhere and, everywhere and they don't know what they're going to do. And I mean, that's just a mild example mm -hmm. of how tampering with, you know, animals and plants can create unintended consequences. Also, you know, the GMO foods, mm -hmm. what are they doing to our health? Yeah. And even if we eat them and we feel fine now, what about 10 years from now? Or what about the effects that they're going to have on our children yeah. in the, in the second generation, third generation? I'm really you concerned know. about that too. Like, I don't yeah. want to be a guinea pig. It, you know, like exactly. If they were tested and super healthy, you know, and we knew fat for sure, I would eat them. But, you know, I'm scared of being a guinea pig for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's. I want to ask you, like, uh, how far would you personally start taking these uh, interventions for aging? Let's say if they cured aging, could you see yourself mm -hmm. actually taking advantage of that? It's not immortality, but it's just right. you're not going to die from aging. Would you personally before? Yeah, that? I mean, I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with using, you know, medical technology and advancement in order to live longer, live a healthier life. You know, for example, let's say somebody is, you know, having heart disease, they have a heart attack, and then they go in and get some kind of an artificial valve put in or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think that any Christian would probably object to that. They'd probably think that that's the most natural thing in the world to just mm -hmm. swap out a bad valve or whatever or get an artificial hip replacement or just, you know, pacemaker, whatever. But I do want to say this, you know, as a Bible-believing Christian, you know, I believe there's one path to immortality and that's yeah. through Jesus. Because mm -hmm. obviously, you know, Jesus said, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? And then he also said, you know, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. So to me, the whole idea of human beings saying, well, I want to try to find immortality physically on this earth, you know, through transhumanism, it is inherently a rejection of spiritual eternal life being offered through Jesus. It's like you don't trust that. You don't want to trust the fact that Jesus died for our sins and he was buried and that he rose again 
as our path to immortality. It's like man's trying to find another path to immortality. Uh -huh. Sort of like in the story of the Tower of Babel that I referred to earlier, they say they're building a tower to reach unto heaven. You know, it's man trying to make his own way to heaven. How do you know Jesus wasn't talking about physical immortality on earth? Physical, like by means of these technologies they're going to come up with in the future. How do you know that that's not what Jesus was talking about? Well, just because there's so many scriptures where he talks about, you know, it's appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. And obviously Jesus is talking about having eternal life and, and his followers having eternal life, but we know that they died physical deaths. Even Jesus died a physical death. And of course he was raised again from the dead three days later, but all of the people that he was talking to where he told these people that if they believed in him that they would never die, they died physically. Okay, so okay. clearly he was talking about, you know, eternal life in the sense that the soul goes to heaven after physical death, mm -hmm. you know. Okay, so you, you think Christians, like a good Christian, would be in favor of curing aging? It sounded like that's what you think. Well, I, you know, I, I wouldn't, I don't have real super strong opinions on you know, what other people would choose to do. Mm -hmm. But in the sense of using medicine, using modern medicine and modern technology mm -hmm. to make us live longer, I'm all for that. Mm -hmm. And I think that your average Christian would be all for that. But that, that's different than obviously trying to achieve immortality, mm -hmm. trying to have eternal life, rather mm -hmm. just, you know, be healthy. Curing age. And here's the thing, you know, I want to live as long as possible physically on this earth. You know, I'm not, even though I believe, obviously, from the uh -huh. bottom of my heart, that I have eternal life and that the moment I breathe my last breath, I'm going to be in heaven, I still want to live on this earth as long as I can to, to fulfill the mission, you know, that uh -huh. God has for me. So, so it sounds like if they did come out with some pill that if you take, you stop aging, it sounds like you would take that. Well, the only, you know. yeah, but I'd be nervous about it because yeah, think yeah. about all the other stuff they've come out with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then it turned okay. out, yeah. How about, how about. <laughs> like if I hypothetically just knew for sure. Yeah. Hey, this thing yeah. has no side effects. Uh -huh. This thing. It's just going to stop your aging. You would take it? I don't know. I mean, that's a hard question just because, it, you know, it's so hypothetical. Yeah. Because it seems like everything has a catch to it. Yeah. In this world. You know, but like, you can't have your cake and eat it. The too. hypothetical could be realistic, like because let's say they came out with the pill very soon, mm -hmm. and then you didn't want to be the guinea pig, so you waited thirty years before you took it, and you saw yeah. well, everyone else that took it, they're fine, they're actually just staying mm -hmm. young. Would you think you might take it then? Yeah, I mean, I, there's always the option that I might take it, mm -hmm. but it's because there's nothing inherently about that that is a sin, according to you. You're saying to take a pill that would stop your aging—that's not a sin. Well, I don't think that there's ever going to be such a pill. But I don't see anything inherently sinful with just basically, you know, doing what's best for your body mm -hmm. and staying on this earth and serving God and, you know, doing good things. I don't, I don't see anything inherently sinful with that in the sense of, hey, your heart's going out, you get a valve replacement, you get the bypass, whatever. Now, there are some people out there who, I guess... Uh, I don't know, Amish people maybe, uh -huh. or uh, I'm sure that there are people out there who don't believe in even going to the doctor or going to the hospital for any reason, and they, they just want to kind of let things run their course. Yeah. I'm sure there are people out there like that. But I'd be willing to bet that probably the vast majority of, of Christians wouldn't see a moral dilemma in preserving the body. So you're saying hypothetically, in five years they come out with a cure for aging, a bunch of Christians start taking this, it's just a pill, uh, and they stop aging, and then hypothetically they live thousands of more years on this planet before the end of the world happens. Mm -hmm. You think that's, that's yeah, but totally it, fine, right? You wouldn't judge those Christians, right? I'm saying no, wouldn't I, I wouldn't. But, but the thing is, though, I don't think that this world's going to go on for thousands more years at all. I don't, uh, you know. I don't know when the end is going to be, and Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour, so we should not try to predict when. But there's no way it's going to be thousands of years from now. I mean, it has to be... Well, hypothetically, uh, it could. Hypoth you don't well, know. Well, here's the thing. You know, the, the Bible call anything in the New Testament is known as the latter days, the last days, the latter times. So my thought would be that if there were about 4,300 years from the creation of the world up until the time of Christ, 
you know, it would make sense that there would be less than that after the time of Christ in order to justify calling it the latter days or the last days. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. if there were just, if it just went on and on and on, at some point it would it would seem like mm -hmm. a strange thing to call it the last days. Here's you the, kind of see what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, let's say that they come out with a cure for aging and a bunch of Christians didn't take it mm -hmm. and they're dying, you know, for, yeah. and, and, you know, over hundreds of years, they're all dying and then you see other people who do take the pill are just getting to live indefinitely. Mm -hmm. um, at what point would you say it qualifies as like suicide not to take the pill? What do you think? Well, first of all, <laughs> you know, just to restate what I said at the beginning of this conversation, like I strongly believe that none of this will ever happen. Yeah. Because of God's intervention in Genesis 3 mm -hmm. and God's intervention in Genesis 11, I don't believe that any such technology will ever exist. Mm. So this is all like very hypothetical. Yeah. And I don't believe in any of this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like I strongly believe that man will never achieve that ability. Okay. But, you know, to say it's suicide, I, see, we could use examples of things that exist right now, though, that are that are a similar moral dilemma. Like, for example, you know, what if what if somebody's heart is giving out because they're old, because they're you know 80 years old, and they say, "Hey, I'm not going to do the the bypass surgery. I'm not going to do the open heart surgery. I'm just going to peacefully die in my home. I've lived my three score and ten years. I'm ready to just go the way of all flesh." I mean, you can't call that suicide. That's, mm -hmm. That'd be ridiculous, because they're not killing themselves. They're just dying of natural causes. They've lived their life, it's over. But it would dying. be suicide if they knew that by taking the intervention, they would live longer. I don't believe so, no. Really? So even Absolutely though, not. given the clear choices, I could do this and live a lot longer, versus I could just die now. Well, because they're following the natural order of things, though. But it's suicide by no. following the natural order sometimes. I don't think so. Really? No. Because you're not killing yourself. Suicide means you're killing yourself. yourself. You're not killing yourself just by not choosing to unnaturally extend your life. No, that's my opinion. Do you think it might be even a sin, uh, according to Christianity, not to strive to cure aging, considering that um, the Bible teaches the message that you shouldn't um, you should try to alleviate people's suffering, right? You should try to help people. And isn't it, by not curing aging, aren't we condemning a lot of people to a lot of horrible suffering with aging and all the aid, uh, diseases that come with aging? So you think it could be argued that it's actually a sin not to cure aging because of the suffering with I don't, because don't. of the fact that, you know, the Bible defines sin as transgressing God's law. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to say that X, Y, and Z is a sin, then to me, you would have to point to a specific law of God that's being violated. That's why earlier when you asked me, hey, is it wrong to try to extend your physical life through technology? Mm -hmm. The reason I said it's not a sin is because if it's not commanded against in God's word, then it's not a sin. You know, Because there are a lot of things that God tells us not to do. If we do those things, it's a sin. Mm -hmm. So therefore, if you're going to say, well, wouldn't it be a sin to not do it? It's like you'd have to point to some scripture well, to how back about like that the, up. How about the Good you know? Samaritan? It yeah. wouldn't have been a sin for that guy to pass the guy in the road, you know. But, right? Wouldn't it have been? Because there, isn't there a sin by by the absence of doing something sin good? Sin by omission yeah, sin versus by omission. the sin by commission. Yeah. yeah. So, in the same way that the Good Samaritan kind of had to help that guy, mm -hmm. had a duty to, doesn't humanity... Doesn't, don't Christians have a duty to cure aging and thereby help the old people who are suffering from Alzheimer's and dementia and these horrible lists of diseases? And so, on and so, on. so how would, how practically speaking, do, would you suggest that Christians would alleviate this suffering? Give money to a anti-aging research. Simple as that. Uh, anti-aging research does not have enough money. And if Christian churches like yourself and you know other pastors started actually preaching that you know hey we should actually try to cure aging because it's a huge cause of suffering and in fact it's actually the biggest cause of suffering by a lot by but a long because more people are suffering from a old age than any other cause and they but see yeah. that's not what we believe though because you know what what i want to spend my money and time and effort toward achieving is getting the message of the gospel of jesus christ to people to me the ultimate suffering is people going to hell when they die 
but not getting old and dying. But because if you cured these people from old age, they'd have so much more time to become Christians. Well, see, I don't agree with that because I, I believe that people get to a point where they've heard the gospel, they understood it, and they've kind of made their choice and, and kind of rejected it. And they, they get to a point where they're done. You know, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to receive the gospel. I mean, the Bible's clear that, you know, people get to that point. And so, you know, that person could live hundreds more years. It's not like there's just more of a chance that they're going to get saved. It, 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 if you're not going to get saved in the 70 years that God's given you, in the 80 years that God's given you, you're probably not going to get saved at all. Okay. And so are people suffering by getting old and, and dying? Well, you know what? Uh, a lot of people probably have an, a nice life, even in their old age, and, and they're probably happy being old and having their grandkids and great grandkids, and then they die and go to be with the Lord. And, you know, maybe a lot of people's suffering and, and uh, you know, agony with being old and everything, I mean, maybe there's other reasons why. So you're saying it's possible God intentionally has aging there as a kind of way people suffer at the end of their life or well but not I just don't think everybody really suffers that much at the end of their life as you you're kind of you're kind of acting like it's just this horrific destiny that we're all heading toward kind I mean of it, is. it doesn't I really have to be have you seen it inside <laughs> of a nursing home these people are not enjoying themselves okay but well but here's here's another thing though okay but see is every old person put in a nursing home no no and and, and here's another thing to think about, you know, besides just the fact that, you know, okay, people are getting old, they're, they're suffering, and it, okay, but eliminating all suffering, eliminating pain. That's the goal of transhumanism. Yeah, but we you know what? It's a, it's a misguided goal. Why is Very that misguided? misguided. Why would that be bad? Because a, a life without pain, you know, is, is not the ideal life, because pain is part of life. We, we can't even enjoy pleasure without having pain there also as a counterpoint. You know, this idea of creating a world where there's no pain and no suffering, and, and in fact, you said that's transhumanism, and, I, and I've even seen transhumanism defined in certain contexts as having a goal of just ending the suffering of all sentient beings. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? <laughs> suffering makes us a better person. Because you know the Builds Bible your character. says exactly. So if you if you had a person who had no suffering in their life, they would be a horrible person. They'd be an evil person. Because okay. suffering makes you a good person. You have a good point on this one. It's I true. I think it's there's <laughs> a lot of truth to what you're saying right there. But see, Jesus himself, the Bible says that he was a man of sorrows and well acquainted with grief. You know, David says in the Book of Psalms, "It's good for me that I've been afflicted, uh -huh. that I might keep Thy word." You know, the Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. You know, I spank my children. You know, that's part of what I believe in regard to child rearing based on the word of God. Well, a spanking's painful. Mm -hmm. But in the end, it creates a better person, okay? Because suffering builds our character. And you know what? I suffer every day. Because, it, you know, and, and here's the thing. <laughs> You know, even just, and this is just kind of a carnal example, a physical example, but, you know, I really like to exercise just for my health and also just for my mental well being. I like to exercise just as a stress relief and just to, just to feel better. But pain is inherent in exercise. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm not any kind of a masochist or anything by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a good feeling to going out and running hard, oh, yeah. swimming, hiking, climbing. You, you're experiencing pain, but is all pain bad? I totally know what you're talking about. I, you know? I'm a, a hot food, spicy food junkie, so it's that pain and then yeah. it's the pleasure. You like that burn. I like the burn, yeah. you know. You want or like the ginger ale that's yeah. real spicy and yeah, burns I on love the way it. down. Yeah, so but see, pleasure, you're trying to pain. eliminate that from the world. <laughs> there's a fine line and it's it's right. it's misguided okay you know we need to go through pain we need to go through suffering it's part of life it's part of the experience and if you took that away you'd turn us all into spoiled brats yeah I think that you, you could know? be right and 
how are those uh, Christians going to, maybe they'll, if they're in heaven, let's say you're right, and there's Christians in heaven and have no pain and suffering forever, yeah. how are they going to avoid reverting into some bad person because they don't have to experience pain anymore? Well, see, that, but see, the difference is that in, in heaven we no longer have the sin nature. We no longer have the flesh that we're living right now. Right now we have the flesh and the spirit, and there's a war going on between the flesh and the spirit according to the Bible. So, you know, if there's no suffering, there's no pain, because of our sinful nature, we're going to become bad people, as it were. Okay. <laughs> Back on the, uh, so, so the suffering. Um, Plus, it doesn't make people happy to give them everything they want anyway. There's an empty feeling in mm -hmm. getting everything you want. Mm -hmm. You know, right? Like Alexander the Great, you know, wept because there are no more worlds to conquer. When you're just handed everything, you don't even appreciate it anyway. Mm -hmm. But when you struggle and fight and, and you, you face the uphill battle, that's what makes life Well, you know, there's a, there's a good chance that a lot of people actually would totally agree with you and that if we were to have some kind of, you know, very technological utopia in the future, we would kind of try to engineer a little bit of suffering in there. The pleasure, you know, <laughs> the pleasurable types of suffering, see, you know what I mean? But like see, this, this whole... Like hot peppers and running and exercising. But know? this whole thing of like, you know, yeah, but we'll engineer it and everything. You know, it's really scary because who's going to be doing the engineering? You know, and that's a real scary question. You know, Especially these kind of it comes to artificial intelligence. Okay, and think about it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay. Plus, you know, whenever artificial intelligence occurs in science fiction, which artificial intelligence is part and parcel of, of transhumanism, Am I right? Mm -hmm. so it's kind of a yeah, related topic. Yeah. Well, you know, whenever there's a science fiction story with artificial intelligence, the artificial intelligence pretty much takes over and wants to kill everybody or mm -hmm. abuse everybody, yeah. you know, and become its own boss or whatever. So, you know, this whole idea of engineering our bodies and engineering everything, my philosophy is that what God has made is perfect. God's creation is perfect. And so when man tries to do better than God, and that's really what transhumanism is at, at its core, when you stop and think about it, it's man trying to improve upon God's creation, saying, you know what, God? You did not make us properly. Well, we're not saying that. We don't, well, a lot of, most of us don't <laughs> believe in God, so we're not going to talk to God. Okay, right. Because but I'm God, saying from a Christian perspective, yeah. though, because I'm a Bible-believing Christian, yeah. to me, when I look at transhumanism, okay. what transhumanism is saying is, you know what, God? You have created this model of a human being mm -hmm. and we can do better. Yeah. We're gonna out-create you, God. And to me, that's blasphemous. And also, mm -hmm. you know, the idea of achieving eternal life Jesus outside said, of Jesus is also blasphemous. Jesus said, so. be perfect, right? So isn't, mm -hmm. wouldn't Jesus, maybe so you could call him the first transhumanist. He's wanting people to be perfect. How else do you be perfect in this, this our bodies are not perfect. They get old but, and die and look at nature. It's filled with horrible suffering. Mm -hmm. Even innocent animals that they didn't they didn't eat the fruit, right? Why should they have to suffer? First of all, you have to understand when the Bible uses the word perfect, it's not our modern definition of perfect. When the Bible uses the okay. word perfect, it means complete. Like for example, the Bible says, if any of you uh, lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And, and it says, let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. So perfect, according to the Bible, means like entire, complete, not lacking anything. Okay. It doesn't mean like uh, without flaw. Because when we say perfect, we mean without flaw. Mm -hmm. But if you look up the word perfect in a dictionary, you'll actually see that it has multiple definitions. And one of the definitions of perfect means complete, not how, lacking anything. How are you anything. supposed to know and which definition Jesus was talking about when he said perfect? What if it is well, the type of perfect? Because, because if you use the Bible as its own dictionary and you look up every time the word perfect is mentioned, it's real clear from the context that perfect is meaning that there's nothing lacking, that it's that it's complete. So I would use the context to let the Bible define itself and be its own dictionary. I'm just telling you that the original meaning of perfect, okay, mm -hmm. if you go back several hundred years in the English language, and if you look up perfect in any dictionary, you'll see that what I'm telling you is true, is different than our popular definition that we have of perfect today. But this idea of look at all the suffering in nature, it's horrible, but again, that you know you're coming at it with the idea that suffering is always a bad thing because what about this what if there are people who deserve to suffer you know if we eliminate suffering well mm -hmm. so you see that is another issue too deserving to suffer deserving right? to suffer
Right. Ooh, and I, see, when it comes to plants and animals, I, I, do, I personally do not believe that plants and animals matter. I don't think that God cares about animals and plants, biblically speaking. I think that they are here for one reason, and that is for mankind to benefit from and use. And obviously a smart person is going to, you know, take care of their animal that is useful to them and, mm -hmm. and plants and so forth. But I, I don't put plants and animals on the level of human beings. I don't think that they're important in the view of eternity because they're going to go to dust and, and they're not. Mm -hmm. You know, man is made in the image of God. Animals don't matter, in my opinion. They don't matter at all? They, they matter in the sense that they're useful to man, but that's why they were created, for man to have dominion over the animals and to use them. I do not believe that animals matter, though. Uh -huh. Like that they have a soul or that they, yeah. that they have a value in the same way that a human being has value. Then wouldn't it be a sin for a Christian to feed his dog and then over the course of a year that might amount to $1,000? When he could have given that $1,000, to you know, feed starving children in Africa. Essentially, he, with his money and his resources, he is prioritizing the life of an animal over the life of a human being. So wouldn't it be a sin for that? Well, Christian? first of all, you know, my dog has a function that's very important because we did not have a dog originally when we moved to Arizona and had people try to break into our house multiple times. Then we got a dog and that mm -hmm. solved that problem. So when I'm feeding my dog, I'm actually securing my my house and my family from mm -hmm. invaders, number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, the reason that people are starving in Africa has nothing to do with me sending a thousand dollars to Sally Struthers or Bono or anybody else because of the fact that, you know, that uh, that money that's being sent over there is not necessarily fixing the problem, you know. And, and I believe that the problem over there is, is uh, number one, there's corruption in government and there are evil people that want to just rape Africa of its resources and keep the people in poverty, keep them uneducated, keep them starving, and so forth. And that number two, that people in Africa who are living a sinful life, you know, are experiencing the judgment of God also. And obviously there are a lot of good, godly, righteous people in Africa also, but there are also a lot of really wicked and evil people over there too. And so I think that the more a society honors God you know, uh, the more people are saved and, and preaching the Bible and following Christian principles, the better off their society is going to be. That's why we're not starving here in the United States of America, mm -hmm. because in the past, historically, we've been a, a Christian nation, mm -hmm. in a sense. Okay. That's why we're not starving right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, obviously, our government is getting more and more corrupt and, 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 and so forth going forward, but that's also in relation to the fact that our country is turning away from the Bible mm -hmm. at the same rate. If a bunch of so. Christians decided to start giving lots of money to anti-aging research, to mm -hmm. companies that are trying to cure aging, would you think God would look favorably on that or neutral or would he care or would he, would he be against it? Well, you know, I, I strongly believe in, you know, our freedom as, as individuals, even in, even in God's economy, he gives us a lot of choices and a lot of freedom. I mean, he definitely has a lot of commandments and things he tells us, don't do this, do this, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that that would be the best use of anyone's money as a Christian because of the fact that the, 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 the important thing is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what would be a better use for the money? Uh, using it to further the gospel of Jesus Christ. So like missionaries and churches? And yeah, churches, missionaries, just, you know. So that's exactly. more important than stopping the suffering of people. Absolutely, because and even extending life. Because okay, what if I can? So you're saying a pastor should spend his money on building a church rather than feeding a starving child in Africa? Well, I'm not saying building a big fancy building. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm ta I'm talking about using money to basically, and and you say, well, how can money be used to you know further the gospel? Well, it could be used first of all to employ people that would go and preach the gospel and missionaries and pastors and everything that obviously need to support their families and be able to do that work mm -hmm. as their job. You know, that would be one thing that it could go toward. Or even toward, you know, for example, you know, buying t technological equipment and everything to be able to broadcast the message of the gospel, okay, and, mm -hmm. and the true word of God. Because the media is controlled by Satan, you know, so if you want to get anything real out there, you have to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be the media. You have to use the internet and so forth to really 
be able to broadcast any sort of truth loudly, okay? Mm -hmm. But you say, man, you know, that's more important than any people suffering, but here's the thing. If I can end someone's temporal suffering on this earth or extend their life to 300 years, okay, and then that person is gonna die and go to hell, then that's really worthless. Because if I can extend that person's life to a thousand years, mm -hmm. but then they're gonna die and go to hell and spend billions of years in hell, yeah. well, what have I accomplished? Nothing. Yeah. Okay, so let's... Every, all the things that are seen, the Bible uh -huh. says the things which are seen are temporal, and the things that are not seen are eternal. So I would rather invest my time, energy, money in the eternal than in the temporal. Okay, let's talk about hell. This is an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. And you talked about earlier, you said people, some people are deserving of suffering. Right. And uh, I don't think I'm deserving of suffering, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, do you think someone like myself, as an atheist, uh, that I deserve to suffer in hell for eternity, even though I feel like I'm a really good person, I go out of my way to help people, you know, I don't feel like I'm sinning, even according to the Bible standards. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe a little bit of sin, <laughs> you know, some sin, well, but minor sins, not like big sins, you know what I mean? Like, I care about people, I try to help people, and I don't hurt people. Here's the thing, why, I, why do I deserve to go to hell forever? I, be that. I believe the Bible is the Word of God. It's my final authority, mm -hmm. you know? Do I think for myself? Of course. Do I use reason and logic and, and learn things? Of course. But my basis, my foundation is the Bible, the Word of God. And the Bible says that you're not a good person, okay? Because the Bible says there's none good but one, and that's God. And the Bible says there's none good, you know, no, not one. We've all, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you can tell me, you know, all day long, hey, excuse me, I'm a good person and I don't deserve hell. But you know what? The Bible says that you do deserve hell. It's that simple. And, and you know, because the Bible says, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, sorcerers, whoremongers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And I'm sure you've lied. We know that you're unbelieving, you know, whether or not you've done everything else on that list, the point is, in God's sight, we're all guilty, we're all damned. But he loves us, that's why he died for us, okay? And he makes it very easy to be saved. It's just, you know, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And do you think God very is easy. perfectly just? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's one of his major attributes mm -hmm. is justice. So you think it's perfectly just mm -hmm. that God would create someone like me, mm -hmm. um, that mm -hmm. I would grow up, become an atheist, um, and maybe you know lie and some other few mm -hmm. minor sins, and that and that I that I'm justly going to burn for eternity in anguish and suffering in hell forever. You think that's just? I believe it's just, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Wow. But um, see, you're but but of course you know you're you're trying to really gloss over your sins and really you know put that kind of spin on it. You know, that's not the way the Bible portrays it. Well, I, don't, you know? I don't know. I'm not a huge expert on the Bible, but I doubt the Bible even says it's a sin not to believe in God. I doubt it. It does. Yeah, it absolutely Where? does. Well, here's the thing. What's a sin? It's violating the commandments of God. And there are all kinds of commands to believe. You know, so there you go. I mean, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's an imperative. You know? Hmm. He's command the Bible says that God has commanded all men everywhere to repent. Mm -hmm. and, and the context there, the repentance is from worshiping false gods or believing in idols and you know, turning to the true and living God. So yeah, there is a command to be baptized, you know, even, which is not uh, having anything to do with your salvation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's something that you do after you get saved, but it's a command. I mean, there are all kinds of commands. There's a command to go to church you know, and to, and to assemble together and so forth. So there are a lot of sins of omission that you're doing too by, you know, not reading the Bible, not praying, not believing in Christ, not going to church, not doing all these things, you know. I mean, the Bible teaches that we're to give 10% of our income unto the Lord. You know, there you go, there's another thing. Uh -huh. But then as far as sins of commission, you're kind of like, well, what have I done? I mean, I, what, I've lied a few times. But there's probably a lot of sins that you probably just don't even know about just because you haven't really probably studied the Bible a lot. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it, mm -hmm. but still, you know, yeah, there's the basic stealing, lying, killing, 
adultery. That's kind of obvious to uh -huh. people. But you know, one of the Ten Commandments is also, thou shalt not covet. Which coveting is when you desire anything that is not yours. It doesn't seem like it's deserving of an eternity in hell for disobeying mm. that. Or lying, or all these other It seems to me that if, when it comes to sin mm. and the Christian understanding, there's big sins and then mm -hmm. there's minor sins. These there minor, are big sins you and might minor be able sins, to argue, I agree with You that. might be able to argue that if there was some rapist, serial killer, pedophile, mm. murderer, you know, maybe that person deserves to burn in hell forever. But you're talking someone like me who goes through life trying to be a good person, mm. you know, even giving to charities, and I deserve to go to hell just because I, I lied or, you know, some other well, minor thing. I mean, what I mean, about blasphemy? Because, I mean, blasphemy isn't really minor, according to the Bible. See, and, and again, this all goes back to just your perspective versus God's perspective. And, and God says in the Bible, you know, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You know, so I think human logic is kind of disagrees with human logic because human logic no. says that is unfair. That is co totally unjust to someone, someone, someone like me to hell for eternity. I don't think it goes against That's human logic. No, because the thing is, it, what you're saying goes against human logic. That basically God creates you for His glory. You only exist because He created you for a purpose to fulfill His plan and for his glory, and you're just like, well, no, I'm just gonna do whatever I want. Whatever I think is right, what seems right to me. So think about this, what if you created a machine? Mm -hmm. What if you created an artificial intelligence, you mm -hmm. know, since we're talking about transhumanism, mm -hmm. and you created it to do a specific task, mm -hmm. and it just refused to do it? You would destroy it and make a new one. Uh, True or false? No. False. Whoa, if you, you build totally a car, false. you build a car and you're like, I'm gonna use this car to drive to work every day, and then the car's just like, no, I'm gonna go where I wanna go. And it's taking you all these places you don't even wanna go. If You'd be like, car, this car's junk. No, if that car was conscious, <laughs> if that car, if I created a consciousness such as some robot that I might create in the future, I would not blame that robot for wanting to do its own thing. It's well, what a conscious I, person. What if I buy a have... dog, okay? Uh -huh. And this dog has one purpose, to be a watchdog. And I'm feeding this thing, I paid for this thing, and it's supposed to bark when strangers come. And this thing is just licking the hand of every invader. You know, I'm gonna get rid of that dog and get a different one. So, you know, God created us for a certain purpose. Get rid of it, but not torture it for eternity in hell. There's a big difference here. You're talking about well, like, there's always going to be a difference because we're using whenever we're using parables and illustrations. Uh -huh. Obviously, you can't go too deep with it. Yeah. The point that I'm making though is that there would be anger involved if I put a bunch of work into something and then it refuses to do what I wanted it to do and it's like oh man I wasted my time now here's you, you say well where does this torture where, just, yeah where like, does that come just, in uh, it's a uh, it seems like a uh, needless suffering yeah. because what's the what's it accomplishing anymore is the person ever gonna? Is God torturing people in eternity of hell for they can so they can? Uh, well, it's not a NBC? it's not a no, correctional it's just, facility. It's just like it's we're not, gonna torture you just for the heck of it. Yeah, it's cruel. It's not to rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. You know for sure. Yeah. Okay, it's a punishment. Yeah. Okay, so you have to just understand that there's a concept of punishment mm -hmm. as part of justice. Okay. Now think about this though. Yeah. Okay, I make a machine. It doesn't do what I wanted it to do, so I throw it away. I create an artificial intelligence, it wants to take over and kill everybody, we're gonna pull the plug on that thing or mm -hmm. whatever, okay? You know, use the sci-fi illustration. But here's the thing about the Bible, it's more complex than that with God because God provided this redemption plan through Jesus Christ where he comes and goes through all this suffering and Jesus went to hell and endured all that suffering. So now it's a question of Jesus endured all the suffering and then we reject that free gift, okay, that's where the wrath is coming from. You know, if you sacrificed your son, you know, <laughs> that someone might be saved and then they rejected that gift, you, you'd be very angry. Let's say, you know, and then- But I wouldn't be if I, if I was expecting him to understand all that through some book, you mm -hmm. know? It's a totally different, like, you know- Well, I tell you what, is, you get your own planet, you be your own god, and then you can do it your way. <laughs> I'm curious to know how you would do it, because, like, let's say you were god. But that's, but would you, and would you create hell if you got to be god? Would you create a hell and per torture people like me for eternity? Does that really Well, here's the thing, I'm not so prideful and arrogant, though, as to think that I'm qualified to be god. You know, I'm just gonna submit to 
the real God. But if you and were, whatever he is, says, I'm not going to fight. What him, if you were you know? forced to be God? It, it's t but here's the thing. Of course, I'm going to be more sympathetic towards sinful people because I'm so sinful, right? Uh -huh. Whereas, see, God's so perfect and holy. Try there's to a put difference yourself there. in his mind for a second. Yeah, Would you but torture that's torture people for eternity. It's crazy. Would you though. Hell? That'd be like if I looked at my dog and said, "Hey, try to put yourself in my position." He he doesn't. There's a difference. So you think that you can't grasp God's mind and why he does things? Or? God, God's thoughts. The Bible says, as the heavens are high above the earth, so God's thoughts are above our thoughts. So for me to sit here and be so prideful and arrogant is to say, well, if I were God, I'd do X, Y, and Z. It's like, well, who am I? I am, I, my intelligence compared to God's intelligence is nothing. You know, so basically you've committed another sin of pride. But to, in order to bring it back to transhumanism, mm -hmm. okay, Let's say I were to hand you, okay, basically a box that contained all the technology you need to achieve all of your wildest transhumanist dreams. Okay, mm -hmm. it's all, all the blueprints are there, all the technologies are there. And I said, listen, you know, you're the custodian of this. I only want you to use it for good. You're the only one who knows this information. Put this into practice for the betterment. You would screw it up. You'd screw up this whole world, okay? Because you'd you be know? like, oh, let's end all suffering, and then you'd create all these monsters, and everybody would be evil because they're not suffering anymore. And you, you'd create these horrible people that live forever, and these horrible machines that would take over and kill us all, and everything. Because man is not smart enough to be God. So we need to just stay I in think, our place here I as humans I, and let God be God, and we be his servants. I think I'd be a very, <laughs> I think I'd be a very good God. I'm sure you do think that. I want to be. Why do you? Would <laughs> you know, there are people right now who basically think that they're qualified to rule this world and, you know, create a global government where basically they call the shots and, and put an end to all the different nation mm -hmm. states and have a one world government, you yeah. know, the new world order, yes. right? Yeah. Now, are these good people or bad, bad people? Idea. I think that, I mean, that sounds like a good plan to me. Yeah, but they're evil people because of the fact that by nature, evil people are drawn to positions of power. You know, evil people like to control other people and be in positions of power. Well, okay. Also, good people you're do me too. But, but here's the thing, you're, right? you're making a face about it, but let's look around no, the no, world no, today. No. Let's look around the world at all the world leaders, okay? <laughs> are most of them good or most of them bad, okay? Yeah. Because evil people, they love to gravitate toward these positions where they get all this glory and where they can play God and, and manipulate people. I personally, you know, am libertarian leaning in my political views because I believe in as minimal a government as possible because I feel like whenever the government does anything, they screw it up. And the more power you give them, the more things are going to be screwed up. And the most totalitarian and authoritarian governments throughout history have been the most screwed up places. And the place where there was the most freedom mm -hmm. were the places where things went well. You know, these engineered economies, they, these planned economies, and, and you know, you look at uh, communist China, Soviet Union, you know, they wanted to succeed, right? They wanted to be the superpowers. They wanted to be greater than the United States. But did it work? No, because when you tamper with God's plan, you screw it up. And you know, whether it's the five year plan of, of Stalin or you know, the great leap forward, oh yeah, we're gonna fix everything, we're gonna organize everybody, but they screwed it up, people are starving to death by the millions, it all fell apart. Whereas when you give people freedom and let things basically just happen organically according to God's design, then people are able to feed themselves and, and things are able to go well. So this idea of a global government, well, well, think about this. What if you lived in a country... A government run by the people, though. A global government run by the oh, people. Oh, oh, oh. Like a, a government, government run democracy. by the people? Which people? Democracy? All of us. You know direct what democracy, democracy is? D direct yeah. democracy is, is yeah. the worst form of government. Because democracy is two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner, number one. And number two is that most people are stupid. So why would you put the majority in charge when the majority is, is idiots? 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So the what I believe the best form of government is is an extremely minimal government, as little government as possible. Sim- almost like anarchy, but just a little bit of police. Some people call like it minarchy. Minarchy. I don't even believe in police. Okay. Yeah, that might be shocking to you. That's a, yeah. But I, I get my views from the Bible. And, and in the biblical model, when God set up the Old Testament nation of Israel, they did not have police. Basically, what, what they had is a citizen, the citizens were the, the police, in a sense. Everyone's armed. And basically, there are judges. But that's a whole other topic. That's, that's very deep to go into all that. But my point being is that let's say you live in a country where things are really bad. Mm-hmm. You know, you're living in the Soviet Union, you're living in North Korea, you know, you're living in communist China. Well, your goal is to get out of there and go somewhere better, right? I mean, that's why a lot of people are leaving Mexico and coming up here because things aren't as good down there and they want to get up here where things are a little bit better, right? And it makes sense. I mean, if I were living in a messed up place, I would But here's the problem with this global government. When it goes bad, there's nowhere to go. I mean, think about that. You got nowhere to flee to. I mean, you know, why did our ancestors come over to the United States in the first place? To get out of Europe. They didn't like the way things were going over there. They wanted freedom. They wanted to start over somewhere. Well, if everybody's under the same government and it goes bad, which it inevitably will, like every government always goes bad, well, then there's nowhere to go. You're stuck in it. It's a, it becomes a prison planet. But how do you stop yeah. all the, uh, you know, the criminals and I'm not stuff trying to. police and I'm not government? Tr- I'm not trying to stop all that stuff. You know, I'm not God. I'm not. <laughs> and here's the thing. When the government tries to stop that stuff, it gets worse. Because you're like, man, we got to step in and fix this. Okay, what about when the government steps in and wants to end the drug problem? What do they do? Make it worse? Yeah. Oh, we're going to stop crime. I they make gr- it worse. I have to agree with you on that one. But I do want a big The war government. on drugs is a failure. The, what, what, it, what about the war on poverty? We got to end poverty. You're going to let all these people starve to death? So we're going to have, you know, the Great Society and all these welfare programs. What have they created? More poverty. I mean, look, go to the ghettos and see all the derelicts and people that don't work and all the, the, the crime and the misery and the suffering in these places. You know, and a lot of it is created by government programs. You know, those people's ancestors, many of them were hardworking people, good people, nice people. Mm-hmm. Now you see a bunch of criminals and, and derelicts and, and so forth. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they grew up where nobody's working. You know, they're on welfare and whatever. So the road to hell is paved with good intentions, you know, and, and people have all the, oh, we're going to end poverty, we're going to end suffering, and they end up creating more poverty, more suffering. Yeah. Look how backfires. I, they make I, drugs illegal, more people are on drugs. Yeah. I've, I actually watched one of your uh, um, sermons on prisoners. And yeah. How you think it's so wrong what's happening with the prison system. Yeah. And I, I got to say, I really agree with you mm-hmm. on that one. And I agree with you on the drug war. Mm-hmm. Look, okay, here's the guy who's one of the greatest men in the Bible, David, right? David is mentioned over a thousand times in the Bible. He's one of the key characters. He's called a man after God's own heart. But what happens when you put him in power as the king of Israel? He does all kinds of bad things. He, he, he's got his own wives, his own concubines, but he ends up committing adultery with another man's wife and then killing her husband to cover it up. It's like, whoa, you have all these women and you're not content with that? Why did he become such a bad person when he started out such a great guy? Because no man is intended to have that kind of power. And the kind of power that we're talking about with global government or these, you know, controlling these technologies of, of so-called transhumanism, you know, is way more power than just making somebody the king of Israel, a small country in the Middle East, okay? Yeah. Power corrupts. Yeah, yeah. We have absolute have, power corrupts, absolutely. We have to have checks and balances. We have to have <laughs> at least a big part of it be democracy. Otherwise, you have no government at but all. But I don't believe Otherwise, in democracy. Otherwise, it's anarchy. I don't believe in democracy. There's the, I don't have democracy in my home. This church is not run as a democracy. I don't believe that our yeah. government should be run as a democracy. You know, in my home, do you think that we vote on things? No. My home is run as a benevolent dictatorship. Because I'm the boss. I'm the head of the household. You know, I'm dad. Mm-hmm. And I make the rules. How do you feel simple. about having a, a robot mm-hmm. as, as a president or ruler? Because that way we could program things like stuff. Uh, Who's we? Like Who's selfishness? programming it? A big team yeah. of the top science. <laughs> a big team of the top science. So this is an artificial of, intelligence. Uh, yeah, we're gonna make Which an artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's hypothetical. Yeah, it's if hypothetical. If we created an artificial intelligence that was so, you know, 
perfect and not selfish. They could actually do a good but, job uh, running the world. Where we're all living in this dystopia, where basically we're all living in North Korea. We're all living in the Soviet Union. We're all living in communist China. We're all living in George Orwell's 1984, okay? That's, what you're, that's what's gonna happen when you have just a global government. And then that's one of the things that's going to bring in the second coming of Jesus Christ. So there, yeah, there will one day be an evil, all-encompassing global government that will be run by the Antichrist. You know, and then of course, God's gonna put a stop to it. I mean, that's Christian eschatology. That's what the Bible teaches is gonna happen in the end times, mm -hmm. okay. And you want it to happen. It, whether I want it to happen is irrelevant. That's a silly question because, it, you know, whether I want things to happen, that's what's going to happen. Well, you're not worried because you think you'll go straight to heaven. I don't, I, I, I know that I'm going to heaven, so I'm not worried about it, no. I don't fear it, but, but I, to say I want it to happen, well, yeah. no, because okay. it's just I'm acknowledging that it's going to happen, mm -hmm. whether I want it to or not. Okay, but I'm not going to side with evil. Like, yeah, let's bring in the evil one world government so we can get closer. You know, I mean, let other people do that. Okay, I don't want anything to do with that. I would stand against global government, stand against the new world order, and these type of things. Okay. Okay. Um, but you're not. It doesn't sound like you're worried at all about death. You know you're going to heaven. Right. You know for sure. Absolutely. Uh, and how do you know for sure? What if you're wrong? Have you, ever, have, you, have you ever asked yourself the question, what if there's not a God? What if I've just been, you know, lied to? The Bible was a sham. Mm -hmm. And aren't you a little afraid that if you die, you're going to cease to exist because you could be wrong and I could be right and there might be no God, there might be no soul, and then mm -hmm. when you die, it's game over. Doesn't that worry you a little bit? No. Because it, it, now I will say this. What you're articulating could be described as just doubt, mm -hmm. right? Because there's faith and then there's doubt. Do I, as a human being, ever experience doubt? Of course, because I'm a human being. I, I'm not just spirit, but I'm also flesh. And so the sinful nature will experience doubt, of course. But as far as, oh man, I'm afraid that I'm wrong. First of all, I believe the word of God from the bottom of my head to the top of my feet. I know that. God is real, I know that I'm saved, I know that Jesus is my savior, but the thing about it is though, that like even if I were wrong, so to speak, which you know I don't believe is a possibility at all, mm -hmm. but I'm saying even according to your paradigm, I'm wrong and, and when you die you cease to exist, then why would ceasing to exist be anything to fear? You don't exist anymore. Oh you don't know, gosh. here's the thing, you, just gave you the wouldn't argument. even know, you wouldn't even know that you're dead. Oh my gosh, you wanna know why it would suck? <laughs> Ceasing to exist. Uh, then I think about this so much because I'm an atheist and I think I'm gonna die. I don't think I'm gonna go to hell. I think I'm gonna cease to exist. And that's what terrifies me mm -hmm. because it's life that's so great. And just to be absent of this amazing thing, it's like the fear of missing out. I don't wanna miss out on the beauty of life. Yeah, but that's a minute ago you are talking about how nature's not beautiful and everybody's suffering and there's all this pain and stuff. It's like. You it's know. better than nothing. Uh, even the, the world, even though it's not well, perfect. Well, you've never experienced I don't nothing yet. So how do you know? Because <laughs> it sucks. I don't think you're ever going to experience I something. I experienced you know, nothing before I was born. And it wasn't how was fun. It? No, <laughs> it, was, it was no fun. Nothingness sucks. So so here, here's the thing. You scoff at the idea of hell. But do you think that it's strange that the whole earth is filled with fire and brimstone? And that basically that the crust of the earth is only 1 to 10 miles thick? and that basically everything else is just molten fire and brimstone exactly as the Bible describes mm -hmm. hell as being in the heart of the earth and below us. I mean, how'd they know that thousands of years ago when they wrote the Bible? Coincidence? No, it's the word of God. Coincidence? They see oh, the volcano. Just, they it see the just volcano. so happens, it just huh? so happens that 99.9% you know, .9 of our planet is just a burning fire and brimstone. I mean, think about this, okay? And yet people ignore this elephant in the room of the fact that, you know, 10 miles beneath our feet, is molten fire and brimstone. It's not it's that like hard. Nobody, to, nobody thinks it's, it's about that. It's not that hard to extrapolate. That. You see a volcano, you're like, oh, mm. that's like, a, you know, it's coming out of the oh, earth. Oh, the earth's round and the whole thing <laughs> is fire and brimstone and the heart of the earth is hell. I, I well, don't... the people in the Bible thought it was flat, right? That's yeah. why they have the four corners. They talk about the four corners no. of the earth. That's not... Again, it's a misunderstanding of the word corner. The Bible talks about the corners of your head. Is your head flat? No, it's just a corner also means quadrant. And that's what it means in that sense. The Bible talks about it as the circle of the earth. It talks about hell being in the heart of the earth. 
it says that God hangs the earth on nothing. So no, the, but everything that the Bible teaches is compatible with our understanding of, you know, that model right there, <laughs> that globe right there. But here's the thing though about it, okay? You know, if you took an apple and let the skin of the apple represent the crust, okay? The skin of an apple is thicker than the crust really is in relation to the earth. That's how thin the crust is, one to 10 miles thick. 10 miles thick at the thickest, and the earth is in diameter what? Like what, 8,000 miles or whatever? Mm -hmm. Roughly. Yeah. Okay, so, so I loved how you were doubting, I loved how much skepticism and doubt you had for mind uploading, because I feel the yeah. same way. And uh, let's talk about doubt. I don't doubt. I don't doubt that if things were to allow to run their course, that if you uploaded the mind, you could look at it, mm -hmm. read it, or re you know. I just don't think that it would be you. Yeah, yeah. Living I'm the same way. But but here's the thing. Me. What about somebody's privacy? I mean, doesn't it creep you out to have somebody just read your mind? Yes, it does. I mean, and it, whoa, it's yeah. Like, it's like the ultimate invasion of privacy. Yeah. I mean, you know, people don't even like people to know what's on their laptop or to you know their smartphone is spying on them or whatever. But going into the mind is the ultimate. We'd have to set up really good, uh, really good secure, security <laughs> systems. So. What a joke, though. All these checks and balances. It's such a joke because the government screws up everything that they do. And you think they're just going to be so good at handling all this. There's a lot of, uh, it's yeah. pretty ridiculous. There's a lot of ways it could go bad. I agree. Yeah, I really agree. Future technology could. is a slippery slope and it's a lot yeah. of dangers we have, to, we have to be aware of. Um, but let's talk about doubt. The reason I brought that up is how much doubt you had over the mind uploading. I just feel like you, your whole philosophy that you're so trusting of the Bible, just like you're yeah. not even willing to doubt it. And no, doubt, I'm not. doubt is like the cornerstone, I think, of a good philosopher. They're supposed to doubt everything and be skeptical of everything. But I'm not a good philosopher. I'm a good Christian. So it's like it's like <laughs> it's like you're giving up your own logic and philosophical mind just in exchange for well, I'm going to believe whatever this book says. Yeah, but that's like know? saying, well, you know, you're you're learning all this math. But you need to be willing to go back and revisit whether two plus two really is four. You know, it's like well, once you you've established, but once you've established something as a concrete fact, you move on. You know, part of learning is that you know something, you know that you know it, and then you move forward. Okay, you build on the knowledge that you already have. You don't just keep going back and revisiting but what if your whole that same core thing, and you don't get anywhere. But you're but you're really messed up if your whole core foundational was yeah. founded on something wrong. That's why I have the right foundation. But how do you know? You're so certain, but isn't I'm that? Very, I'm quite certain. How do you know that? How humble. do you know that you're that's right? That's not humble. I certainly don't know that. Yeah. Right. So I might be right. You could be right. I could be right that 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 all the fire and brimstone is not there by accident. It's hell. You could be right. Right? Well, see, I'm. I have the humble position. I'm saying I don't know. I. You could be right. You're. You're sitting over there, kind of arrogant, saying, "I know I'm right. I know you're wrong. I know. You know. You're not." You have the humble position of saying that you'd be a better God than God Himself. Uh, you have the humble position I've, of thinking that if I handed you all the technology of transhumanism, that you would be able to just turn this world into a wonderful place. Okay, I'm not saying I know no. for sure I would. I'm humbling myself before God. See, I don't think it's prideful for me to say, hey, the Bible's God's word, it's settled, I believe it. Because aren't I deferring to God at that point? I mean, how is that pride to say, you know what, God's word is the truth and I'm not smarter than God, so I'm not going to question it. That's not pride. I mean, how's that arrogant? Well, it, it's a, it's a, well, it's gullible. It's not not doubting. It's not doubting. Yeah, but gullible is when you believe something stupid. But see, but I'm is, not believing something that's stupid. I'm believing something that is the most amazing book ever written. Even people who don't even believe the Bible acknowledge that it's one of the greatest books ever written. So it's not like I'm just believing everything I read or believing the next thing that came along. I mean, this is an amazing book, so I'm I'm putting my faith in something that that really is worthy. That's not being gold. I mean, that's like calling someone gold if they believe anything. If you believe anything anyone ever tells you, you're gold. Yeah? No, gold is when you believe stupid things that have no basis. And there's a lot of basis for me to believe the Bible. There's a lot of reasons why I believe in it. What's the biggest reason why you believe in the Bible? Because I. I I don't see any reason why I should believe the Bible and the, is it, I don't know how do I know that it's of well, course historical how do I even know that Jesus existed for real I don't what's the well, best reason you have why should you believe the Bible I the, the best reason that I have and, and in fact I would say 
you know, the only evidence for the Bible is the Bible itself. You know, because the Bible is such an amazing book, and the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So where does my faith come from? Hearing God's word and the power of God's word is why I believe in it. I believe in the Bible because it has power. The words are powerful, unlike any other words. It's like the people who were sent to arrest Jesus. They went back to their superiors and they're like, why didn't you arrest him? And they said, never man spake like this man. And they're like, they were blown away and they, they, they were afraid to arrest him because they were so taken in by his, the power of his words, you know? And then they're like, are you also deceived? You know, the superiors got angry at them. So, you know, God's word is so amazing and so powerful. I'll put it this way. You know, if I were to take a diamond and a cubic zirconium and show it to the jeweler, he can tell me which one is made by God and which one is made by man. If I look at a cell phone tower that's made to look like a tree, and then I look at a real tree that's made by God, there's a colossal difference between what God has made and what man has made. Okay, and I can look at that tree and know for certainty man did not create this. This is God's handiwork in this tree or this diamond or whatever. But when I look at the Bible, it's the handiwork of God. You know. So you think you can know for sure? For Absolutely. sure that you're saved? Well, look, if I took you outside and you looked at that tree and said, do you, and I asked you, do you know for sure this is a real tree? Are you sure it's not artificial? I would say no. But see, here's the sure. thing though, you're not being a good philosopher either then, because the thing that you learn in philosophy 101 class is that you have to start with some basal assumptions or else all philosophy Only becomes one, meaningless. Only one, you exist, that's well, the, it, that's No, that, no that's not true, you need three basal assumptions. What? Philosophy 101 okay. teaches three basal assumptions, okay. not one, okay? okay. What else? Because just one, I exist, yeah, but you also have to have an assumption that number two, that what you are experiencing through your five senses is real. That's another basal oh. assumption that's necessary. Because just the fact that you exist is not enough because, you know, what if everything that you're seeing, smelling, tasting, and hearing, what if none of it's real? What if it's all part of a, a dream or a simulation or, you know? So that's why even a, 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 an atheistic philosopher is starting with certain basal assumptions, okay? Otherwise, all of philosophy becomes meaningless of just, where if we just question everything, that's and we have, I think and we have no basis, then basically we were just gonna go in circles and get nowhere. You're gonna accomplish nothing. You can always, you could prepare for all the worst case scenarios. Be open to every possibility, question everything, and you know just prepare if, for if you're multiple open, scenarios. If you're open to every possibility, that's very foolish. Like, what if, what if uh, Thomas Edison's trying to make the light bulb, and man, he's just open to every possibility for the filament. You know, he's never going to get to the right one. He's going to rule out some stuff that he knows, okay, this isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and, then, and get down to some stuff that might work. Yeah, you okay? start to... You, you, have to st yeah. you have to build parameters of thinking and say, hey, okay, you know, I know 2 plus 2 is 4. And, and you got to settle that. You can't just spend the rest of your life in kindergarten math class. You know, you settle it. Okay, look, 2 plus 2 is 4. I know that. Now I can move forward into algebra, calculus, mm -hmm. etc. But if we're constantly going back and just read, I don't know. I mean, I mean, is pi really, you know, three point one four, whatever? You know, I don't know. Is is is? It's good to ask that every now and then. Is you know the the. The, the A squared plus B squared, does it really equal C squared? You know, we're just wasting time going back and, and, and reevaluating well, all that I, stuff. I think you should be open to every possibility, but then you, uh, what's, according to what's most likely, you kind of focus in on those what's most likely, but you don't get rid, you don't say, well, I know those mm -hmm. things. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you, okay, Paul the Apostle, yeah. you think you know that you're saved. Well, Paul the Apostle, how do you uh, dis explain this verse? He said, the man who says he knows a thing does not yet know as he ought to know. So here you are saying, I know I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. And Paul well, is saying, the man who says he knows a thing does not yet know as he ought to know. It sounds like he's saying, he's yeah, agreeing with see, me. Yeah, but see, this is taking a verse, you know, totally out of context, misquoting it, you know, and just basically applying it in a way that was never meant to be applied. Because what about all the times that the Apostle Paul said things like, you know, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. You know, we are confident and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. 
if you looked up all the times that Paul said we know and I know and we know, there's a ton of times. When he says if any man think he know anything, okay, he's talking about knowing something contrary to the Word of God, knowing anything outside of the Word of God, and basically a person who thinks that their idea is greater than what God's idea is, you know. So he's not just saying, well, if anybody thinks they know anything. Look, if a person said to me, well, I'm not really sure if two plus two is four, I would say that that person is a fool. And if a person said, well, you know, I'm 99.9% .9 sure that two plus two is four, but I'm always going to leave open the possibility that it's not, I would personally deem that person a fool. I think that, you know, wisdom establishes facts and then moves on, moves forward with the discussion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and to sit there and, well, how do we know this? How do, how do we know that any of us are real? How do we know we're even really sitting here right now talking? You know, I think that's just uh, vain jangling. You know, it's just foolishness at that point. So I'm not claiming, just to kind of wrap up this part of the discussion, you know, I'm not claiming to be able to prove scientifically that the Bible's true. Of course not. I'm not claiming to be able to prove in any way that the Bible is true because we have to believe the Bible by faith, but it's not a gullible, blind faith. It's faith in the power of God's Word, which I think is a great place to hang your hat. Okay. If now you found out, if hypothetically you found out there was no God, what would you do? Would your life be different? Because I've heard a lot of Christians say, for mm. instance, that they're, they wouldn't be moral anymore. That yeah. the only reason to be moral is because there's a God that's going to punish you, and that if there was no God, they would just go out and rape and pillage and be as evil as they wanted to be. I want to know, are you in that same camp as people? Or? Well, here's the thing. I, I wouldn't say that I would go out and rape and pillage, okay? But would I do things differently in my life? Absolutely, yes. Because, you know, for example, even the Apostle Paul said, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men most miserable. He said... You know, if there's no resurrection, he said, let us eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, you'd live your life different. I'm not saying that I would go out and just, oh, yeah, let's go murder and, you know, mm -hmm. commit adultery <laughs> and rape and kill. Uh -huh. But here's the thing. Would you live differently? Of course you'd live differently. Absolutely. How because would you personally live differently? Would you be more hedonistic? Or what kind of things would you do that you're not doing now? Well, I mean, I wouldn't be, pa I, I certainly wouldn't be pastoring a church. Uh-huh. You know. Uh -huh. because, I mean, what would be the point? You know, you'd yeah. go get a different job because it'd be it'd be ridiculous at that point. But, you know, I don't want to sit here and just delve into everything I would do if I didn't <laughs> one believe. One or two. Come on, I, one I, or two. Because I do believe. We're you curious. know, I do believe the Word of God is true. So it's, it's you know, I, I think hypotheticals can sometimes be silly or meaningless. But, but, like what? but the, to answer your question, yeah, I would change the way I live my life. But I'm just and really I would curious. have different values because I'm really right now I'm living my life where I'm valuing that which is eternal. Uh -huh. Well, if 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 all we have is this life, then you would put more value on that which is temporal. Yeah. You know, it, maybe I'd join your, uh, you know, uh, transhumanist movement because you want to live forever physically. You know, I'm just kidding. No, but I, no, but if you I'm had no saying, hope of heaven, if you had no hope of heaven, you'd probably be heaven. more concerned about extending your physical life. You'd for probably sure. be a lot more yeah, like absolutely. me. Absolutely. If if you if you did not believe in the Bible, you don't believe in Jesus, you yeah. don't believe that he has eternal life, then obviously, you know, you could be motivated to go find it somewhere else. I'm not motivated to find it somewhere yeah. else because I believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Yeah, and, and you might be surprised to hear this, but I've talked to a lot of my fellow atheists, mm -hmm. and even they don't want to live forever. They don't care about, they don't care if they die and cease yeah. to exist. It doesn't even bother them. But that them. doesn't surprise me at all because, like I said, ceasing to exist isn't that scary of a thought. Now, going to hell is a very scary thought. Okay. Ceasing to exist is very ceasing scary to, exist, to me. I mean, it's horrible. It's painless. You can never have fun ever again. You're missing out forever. It doesn't bother you. Missing out on what? If Fun! If, hold on. If, athe if atheism is the legitimate philosophy here, okay, then no, life has no meaning. If we're animals, we might as well be a plant. Our life has no meaning. We, we, we live, we die, no one remembers us, no one knows us. I mean, what's the point? I agree with you if you die. It's all meaningless. I agree that life from an atheist perspective, mm. sh we should mm. see it as meaningless if we die and cease to exist. Yeah, but it has to end because, for example, and this is now we're going to go real deep. Okay. Okay. 
huh. into you know the whole atheist paradigm. Mm -hmm. Okay, but what about the fact that those who believe in the so-called Big Bang and evolution, you know, they have their own theories about the end of the universe as we know it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because, you know, obviously we believe in the Bible and the book of Revelation and all those things. But, you know, according to this scientific quote, you know, I, I believe it's what the Bible calls science falsely so called. But according to this evolution Big Bang paradigm, you know, the world's going to end in one of a few different ways. You know, one of them heat is the, the you know, the heat death is one, which basically is, is you know, everything's just going to run out of steam, as it were. Okay. Or there's what's known as the big crunch, right? Which is sort of like the opposite of the Big Bang. Because if everything has gravity and everything's pulling, eventually everything would be pulled back in to that, you know, infinitesimally small point, and then there would be another Big Bang. Mm -hmm. And it would all start over again, okay? And they even have theories about, you know, how many billion years that's gonna take and whatever. And what's interesting about that is that there are a few different camps of, on that philosophy as well of, you know, some of them say, well, when it explodes, it's going to explode the exact same way that it exploded last time. And we're going to be having this exact same conversation uh, like, is this 30 repeat? billion years from now. Like the Groundhog exact, Day. Just yeah, like, the exact conversation forever. we're having right now, we, we had this conversation 30 billion years ago, and it went exactly the same way it's going right now. And uh, we're going to do this, <laughs> and, we, and we, we're going to keep doing this, mm -hmm. all right? Which I think is, is bizarre I and stupid. But see, I think the whole Big Bang and evolution is bizarre and stupid. I think the whole thing is ridiculous and, and, and flies in the face of everything that we know. Mm -hmm. But then there's another philosophy that says that there's a, a certain amount of randomness. Because if you think about it, if supposedly the Big Bang came from all matter being crammed into one point at an infinitely small size with an infinite amount of energy and then it exploded, then it should explode the exact same way that it exploded last time, according to that logic. But then some people say that there's an element of randomness in the universe, that that's one of the laws of nature, and so things would not go exactly the same mm -hmm. that, as they went last time. <laughs> okay, I want. But I to me, it's so bizarre that anybody actually believes any of yeah. this. You know, morality. Just I want to ask you a little bit about the morality issue. You think it's fair and just that um, you, you think Christians like yourself, once saved, always saved. I know you believe once oh, saved, yeah. always saved. The big thing Big you. time, yeah. You think someone like yourself can go out there and rape, murder, and pillage, and that there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. That doesn't sound like you even have a lot of fear of God, which I well, thought that was supposed believe, to be a Christian teaching, yeah, but, here's but the you thing. think you could do anything. We believe that if we sin after we're saved, that our punishment will come in this life. So we're not saying that there's gonna be no consequences. We're mm -hmm. just saying you're not gonna lose your salvation and go to hell, but that you'll be punished in this life. All right, this has been a great interview with Stephen Anderson. Uh, can you give your links or anything? I'll put them in the description. Yeah, the you know, faithfulwordbaptist.org. Just, just go to YouTube and search Faithful Word Baptist Church. 